certainly last but not least, we have uh, Jan Peleg, the founder of uh, Deep Training, and also a very known, a very known data scientist here in Israel. All right, so uh, I'm going to speak about uh, deep learning and tabular data, uh, as more specifically about a Kaggle competition uh, that uh, we all worked on. Uh, Andrei Taran, Lior Sorkin, Yotam Feinberg, Elad Vash, and myself. By the way, they're all here, scattered around. Um, anyway, so uh, we have uh, tabular data uh, that looks kind of like this. It's a table, like a CSV, a spreadsheet or something. Uh, for example, Kaggle housing prizes. Uh, we have rows that uh, are, you know, pretty much the houses, uh, and we have data like how many floors the house has, or, or does it have a pool or not. So uh, let's do the most uh, uh, smart thing and use deep learning for that. And uh, the experiment setting goes the following: uh, we are going to validate for oh, whoops. we are going to validate for five k folds, and uh, the score is going to be RMSLE. And one uh, last thing, no feature engineering at all. These are the rules. And uh, baseline, random force scores uh, 0 0.147713, uh, sorry. Um, fully connected network scores the following, all right. Uh, convolutional neural network doesn't work as well, not surprising. And LSTM doesn't work as well, not surprising. What is surprising is that a meta-learning of whatever you want doesn't work as well, because there is an acute problem with doing that. I know it's interesting on its own, so just a couple of words about this. Uh, the thing that you see now is an RNN, uh, just generating uh, strings. The strings uh, represent network architectures and so on. Um, moving on, uh, the score of the meta-learning is, uh, is, is, you know, better than the random forest, but, you know, random forest is not the best thing we can do here, and we didn't do even a, a little bit of feature engineering here. So, uh, you would like, uh, some of you probably would like to say, all right, then use embedding layers, and you would be correct. So, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, embedding is the trick that you take a couple of orthogonal vectors, uh, multiply them by a matrix, and basically uh, the, representation learned, uh, the representation learned for each and every one of the categorical features do not interfere with one another because of the, because of the orthogonality. All right, so uh, doing so with embeddings gets to the following score, which is not great. Um, all right, so let's include some embedding tricks. Uh, the most important one is entity embeddings for uh, categorical features. Uh, it's a, a really good paper for anyone who is using uh, embeddings whatsoever. Uh, feel free, uh, just search for it. Uh, one of the tricks of this paper is to have a skip connection between the input, you know, above the embedding, and the thing, uh, the thing that this, uh, this calls the network to do is to preserve the orthogonality uh, after the embedding, and then you can just go and put fully connected layers, and basically you're working inside the categorical as well, and then you have like deep embeddings. Some more tricks that uh, we included is, you know, dropout and uh, fields, which I'm going to talk about uh, in, in a couple of slides, uh, gated embedding and, and multi-distance embedding, and positional encoding. All right. You're not synced. Um, they're not synced. Just a second. All right. And positional encoding, again. Anyway, um, uh, and then uh, we did exactly what you think. We just uh, took all of this and thrown it into took all of this and thrown it into uh, an, uh, a meta-learning uh, framework and just waited a little bit. You know, it's a little bit wider than before. Give it a second, it gets to something interesting and then we can talk about. All right, at the end it gets to this network structure. And with a grain of salt, please, because I really am not sure about this, uh, we can see that uh, each and every one of the inputs got some sort of an encoder that looks the same. It pretty much ignored the embedding, used an LSTM instead, and concatenated a permuted convolution on the other axis. Basically, it's a fully connected over the feature space. And the decoder looks kind of like this. Um, the thing that's interesting to see here is that we have a concatenation of a mixture of experts with a skip connections through some 
uh, activation. We think about, we, th we see this pattern a lot, and we think that it's some kind of an ensemble because mixture of experts is something that destroys the information, and when you skip connect uh, over it, you can think about it as an ensemble of two networks, you know, widely connected. All right, putting that aside, the score of all of this is this. N not great. All right. Uh, but uh, after all of this, is there anything else we can do? So let's take a slight detour to uh, uh, something that we heard a lot about today, uh, recommendation systems. And um, basically, uh, basically, the idea of looking into recommendation systems is, let's say that you have a document classification problem and you would like to classify the documents. So the rows in, the, in your matrix are going to be the documents, and the columns are going to be uh, things inside the documents, and we would like to use this information to predict something else. So in recommendation systems, let's say that you have a bunch of users and they would like to buy a product, so you're doing the right thing and, you know, Propose, uh, propose some sort of a product to them uh, of a different kind, but instead of predicting something else, you would like to model the interaction. Oh, something here is a little bit off. Anyway, moving on, the thing about recommendation systems is, is that you would like to model the interaction between, between the rows and the columns, and they don't have any spatial correlation or something that deep learning is pretty good at. So we looked a lot into those. And uh, the most naive thing you can do is matrix factorization and uh, basically use something like an SVD. And, uh, and if you connect, uh, and, and there is an interesting connection between SVD and, embedding, and embeddings by uh, Joab Goldberg from uh, 2014. And basically, uh, under certain cir circumstances, um, they are pretty much alike, and the representation power is pretty much the same. But we also saw that uh, embeddings are, like, you know, really good. Uh, so uh, there is, and, and, in, and there is a question arises, how come embeddings are, are better than SVD on many types of problems that we also So I don't want to go too much into why, uh, but if you look at the papers closely, you would find that those papers are, do are doing a lot of tricks. Uh, beside actually using embeddings, um, some of those tricks are the following. Um, but let's go back to building a neural network. All right, so uh, if this is deep learning and this is wide learning, then this is deep and wide learning. It doesn't, it's not a big secret. And the score of this, the score of this on Kaggle housing prizes is the following. And a little bit of, uh, a, a little bit of improvement is with a cross product instead of just concatenation and hyperparameter optimization, residual skips, highway networks, and again, full meta learning of each and every one of the networks. This is not going to show, I'm not going to show this here because, all right, you've seen, because that's enough. Uh, all right, so let's generalize this a little bit. Uh, we take the network as before. Uh, we have a bunch of embedding layers. On one side, we have a deep neural network, but on the other side, we would like to do something a little bit different. We would like to understand the connection between them, the interaction between them all. So we just take the, so we just take the product of each and every one of them with respect to each and every one of them and assign latent vectors to be learned during the training. This is called factorization machines. So. Uh, if, you, if we use a factorization machine on one side and a deep neural network on the other side, we get the following score on uh, Kaggle housing prizes. And uh, if we do a pre-training for the factorization machine, we get a really better score, but we're not going to do that beca because it's not end-to-end. -end. Um, another thing we can do is hyperparameter optimization. And a, a small improvement for that is product uh, neural network, product not production, like dot product this kind of product. And product neural network gets the following, uh, gets the following score, and outer product, and inner and outer products gets the following score. All right, uh, why is that? If you go and look at the gradients of this, it's just, you know, like all over the place. So uh, a, a small improvement for that is to have skip connections from the input into all the network, into all the network layers. This is called a cross network. And, uh, and the score of that on Kegel housing prizes is the following. So a modification to that is the following. Instead of just taking the inner product and, and just you know w hoping for the best, the thing that we are going to do is take the outer product, concatenate it as before, and just, and just feed it to a very specific activation. This is not dice of dice loss. This is dynamic interaction 
I forgot. Anyway, the idea here is that you create some sort of gate, and then you can use this unit in parallel many times, and this is how you get good interaction capturing of the network. All right, so uh, the uh, score of this is the following. Again, not the best, all right? Now we have a problem, and the problem is that uh, dot products and outer products and inner products assign the same weight to any part of the input. So uh, we do the, the most naive thing uh, ever and just apply attention to all of that. And the score of this is the following. And now we have a different problem. Uh, those networks do not scale well to deep, uh, to being deep, and there aren't enough layers. So basically, instead of just doing it as a vector, we we'll just take all the inputs uh, with respect to all the inputs as well, like n squared, and now we, cre we have a matrix, and basically now we can apply as much layers as we want. It works. All right, so uh, this, is, uh, this is called NFM, Neural <coughs> Factorization Machine, and it still doesn't work. All right. Um, all right, so what was the problem here? The problem here is that uh, houses in New York, houses in Tel Aviv, houses that have pool, the interaction between them, there is a hierarchy between them that we didn't take in consideration. So the most naive way to take this hierarchy is something called field, field-aware factorization machines. Basically, you take the city, you have two floors, and you create two more embeddings, and then just cross them out to create all the possibilities. All right, and this, way, and this trick pretty much gets us way better score than before. This is one of the breakthroughs if you're looking into deep learning on tabular data. All right, so, but some of you would like to say, all right, so well, let's just use convolutions, right? Because convolutions, neural network, and so on. All right, so the most easy thing we can do is just, you know, have a convolutional neural network to generate features for us, but apparently this doesn't really work. Um, all right, so a different approach. Let's just take all the, all the data, just put it into, into a table and go with like 1D convolution and hope for the best. And this doesn't really work as well. All right, so can we use uh, CNNs anyway? All right, so let's try to generalize convolutions, like spatial convolutions, as you know, but to something like a table. All right, so Instead of just applying a filter uh, that is going on over the image, we just take a filter at the size of the whole row, and you, we take a bunch of them and create feature maps. And just to complete the convolution, we just sample on the right axis, and this is how we generalize convolution you know, to, to, for something like a table that doesn't have spatial correlations. All right? This is called XDeepFM. It had been shown here at the conference like uh, two hours ago, I think and it works really well. Um, but speaking about attention, um, all right, so self-attention is the thing that you just do the attention, but a little bit different. You just take all your inputs, and from each input, you, 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 you take each input like three times, one as a query, once as a key, once as a key, and one as the value that you would like to propagate forward. And and the way you actually use it is you use it to predict the same input as before. Like for every input, you predict all of the sequence, again, n squared. And the process looks kind of like this. Say that we have two inputs, so we would have two, uh, two queries, and as well, two keys and two values. And for the other input as well, we just multiply each query by each key, and then multiply the thing that we get to the values, and this is how we create a self-attention network. All right, so self-attention instead, uh, instead of the other attention works pretty well, actually. All right, um, so uh, how can we do anything better than that? All right, so the attention mechanism pretty much goes the following. We have an alpha, uh, uh, alpha alignment scalar, and basically we align based on some sort of score matrix. So, you know, there are many people who came with different approaches for scores. Uh, but I would like to propose a different approach for all of this. Uh, so for x, uh, input value, v, hidden state, and w, learned parameters, the attention that we're going to use is this. By the way, this is just exactly the same thing that you saw before, just with graph convolutions, so we can work on symbolic learning. Just give it a second to get to the final yeah, yeah, it's doing that. Yeah, yes, yes, it's doing that. Some of those are wrong, are wrong, by the way. If you look into them, you find that they make no sense. If it's doing something that is wrong, it's negative reward. Anyway. Hmm? No, no, it just it runs faster because it ends not on this. 
apparently, but leave that aside. After all of this, we get to the score uh, M. That is not, you know, it's a, it's a little bit depressing. So we might go and say, all right, the end, did we just lose? Uh, so we, we decided that we're not going down without a fight. So uh, we did exactly what you think, and then we just put anything that you just saw into a huge meta learning. Give it a second. Let's see what it gets to. Just a second, it takes some time. This is like two weeks, so. <laughs> all right, it got to this. All right, zooming in. Uh, all right, I only have one minute, so it's okay. Zooming in, uh, on the left branch here, it's mostly dense layers, so it's not interesting. After that, it's doing something that is interesting. We see that it is using, again, a mixture of softmax, but again, with the concatenation from the layers before, something that destroys information and something that, you know, gets information from before, and then feed it through gating. Something really cool that it learned to do on its own is using batch normalization with different masking, basically making different types of normalizations. All right, um, but unfortunately, I cannot tell you batch normalization of what. That's a problem. Anyway, um, if we look into the encoders, we see... If we look into the encoders... Just a second. All right, so if we look into the, if, all right, so I think we're left with batch normalization, but, uh, thirty seconds. All right, no, just a second. Let me try again. All right, wait. It, it doesn't matter, it's like the last slide, but uh, it would have been nice. Anyhow, uh, I can zoom into the network, but uh, you know, the, the bottom line is that uh, I'm not sure uh, about all of the things. I just wanted to show you what it got to. And yeah, so for the scores and the results of everything, you're more than welcome to go and see for yourself on Kaggle. And uh, we are like, we we're like really high and uh, below us or like 700 models, models and symbols and so on, and we do it with one deep learning model. I'm not taking credit uh, first for all the work myself, there are a lot of people who worked really hard for this. And another, another important thing, I'm not taking credit for you know, generating the model because you've seen yourself. Uh, so uh, that's kind of it, I think, and uh, hope uh, you liked it. Thank you, thank you for coming. very much. It was a very interesting talk. Can you please share your uh, Where are meta? You? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ca ca can you please share uh, your meta learning library you used? Uh, it, it, was it used bo for both symbolic learning, for bo symbolic uh, formulas and uh, neural networks, Bo both of it's them uh, was in the, with the same meta learning library? F first thing, yes, the, uh, both the symbolic learning and the deep learning is using currently the same uh, meta learning framework. It is something that uh, we developed in-house, but uh, some, there are some uh, really good, actually, meta learning frameworks open source today, so uh, that specific thing is something that we developed in-house, but uh, there are many open source libraries as well today. Thank you.